Hey, what's up everybody? So in this video series, I plan to show you everything you need to know to get Foundry Virtual Tabletop up and running and playing Dungeons and Dragons or whatever other tabletop RPG you'd like. In my last video, I showed you how to install the program and create your first world. Uh, you can get the link up there, I think, uh, if you missed that video. And today I'm gonna take you through a bunch of its main settings and show you how to configure everything to meet your needs. There's a lot of settings, so we're splitting this video into two parts. The second part, when it's released, will be in the description below, or will be in the next one in this video series. In future videos, I plan to show you how to do everything from creating maps and tokens and tables and compendiums, show you the basics and more advanced controls, how to create awesome lights and sound effects, and even take you through my favorite modules and show you what ones you should utilize for your own games. If you've seen my big multi-group shared world campaign, The Chords of Chaos, which I stream live on Twitch and post the VODs here to YouTube, then you already know I really like to add a lot of production value to the game, and Foundry really helps me do that. If these videos help you out, then do me a favor and drop them a like and subscribe to the channel to get more videos like these in the future. Also, consider dropping me a follow on Twitch where I stream every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. If you're looking to get in on my big Dungeons & Dragons campaign, The Chords of Chaos, you can learn all about it on my website and sign up on my Discord server. All of my links are in the description below. So with that all out of the way, let's get into this. So first to navigate to the settings, you're going to click this little cog up here above the chat room, and that'll bring you to the settings tab. Uh, the big meat is going to be in configure settings, so we'll handle that later. Uh, for now, let's start with manage modules, and this is pretty straightforward, so we won't go into this too much. I like that Foundry lets you enable and disable modules uh, at will rather than just automatically like installing everything once you download them. Uh, this makes troubleshooting a lot easier, and you're going to, as you build up your sort of repository of modules, you're going to find that a lot of them do not work very well together. Uh, the module makers are pretty good about addressing some of the stuff, but sometimes, you know, they they drop a module and they don't update it for a long, long time. And then you wind up having to get rid of that module permanently or, you know, you, one way or another. Believe me, you're, if you start using modules, you're going to have to troubleshoot your modules. There's a few good ways of filtering through here. One, you can use the search there. And you can say token, and that'll show you all of the modules that have the name token in them. Uh, this is pretty useful if you know what the module you're looking for is called. Uh, aside from that, we've got the all modules tab, the active modules tab, and the inactive modules tab. Uh, that really helps filtering that down. You can also deactivate all of them with just one button click and then at the end, you always have to remember to save. You can't just click, 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 and then close it out. You got to save. Ironically, there are modules that help you manage your modules out there. Uh, that's a little bit beyond the scope of this video, but go look for them. They can be pretty helpful. Next, let's look at the configure players setting. This is where you set up roles for each of your players you plan to connect to the game. You can set up the username and password to be anything you want. And once you've set them up and saved, if you ever forget what a password is, you can just scroll over here and it will reveal the password for you. Uh, it won't reveal the password the first time you put it in. Don't know why, it's kind of weird. Uh, the other thing is the user role. This one it seems kind of complicated at first. It's definitely not super duper intuitive but basically it comes down to configure permissions. And as you can see, we've got uh, none player trusted assistant and game master. And then we've got these four columns of settings that you can configure per uh, user type. Uh, none is good if you are trying to disable one of your player roles from the game. Uh, or, you know, if you need to temporarily ban somebody or something like that, this pretty much removes all of their settings, all of their, they, they don't basically have no option for interacting with your game if you set it to none. Uh, my recommendation is, uh, unless you have a very specific use case, you're probably best off just having the one game master and then set everybody else to player. Makes things a lot easier, but if you have very specific use cases, 
there are some differences that go even beyond these settings here. Uh, we'll go through each of these settings later. Um, the big thing to keep in mind is that the game master and assistant game master have access to certain things like uh, they can see through the fog of war at all times, regardless of uh, what uh, token permissions they have, whereas the players are restricted to only the vision of tokens that they have ownership over. Uh, the other thing is the GMs can handle things like music and other similar things like that. Uh, like I said, we'll go through the permission configuration uh, later. Uh, once you're done with that, you want to save. Once your game is set up, you'll want to click on invitation links. These are the links to your network or your IP address, uh, which you can give to your players either on your local network if they're on your router or over the internet if they're not. Uh, I am not pl really planning on doing any troubleshooting guides or tutorials on how to set this stuff up. This is pretty complicated. Uh, there, it's like port forwarding and that kind of thing. It's either going to be really, really simple for you or it's going to be a giant headache. The problem with doing a tutorial for it is everybody's router is a little bit different. So I there's not just like a catch all that I can do for you. If you're having trouble, if you don't know how to port forward, Go on to the Discord for Foundry. There are people there who deal with this stuff and they can help you out and there's all kinds of guides. Do a Google search for your router and, and forwarding your ports and all that. That's how you'll figure it out. You're not gonna find it out from a YouTuber. Uh, probably not anyway. Okay, now that we've got that figured out, let's finally go up here to configure settings. You'll see we've got three tabs, core settings, specific to Foundry as a whole, system settings meaning your game system in my case dungeons and dragons uh, i'll go over this for anyone playing fifth edition dungeons and dragons since i feel like this is probably the most applicable to most of you um but if you're playing another system th these settings will probably look a little bit different but it's it's pretty much the same kinds of things that you'll probably expect to find uh, and then module settings, which is specific to the modules that you are running. That's a little bit out of the scope of this video, so we'll go over that another time. So let's talk about the system settings for the Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition system. The first setting it offers is your rest variant rules, which you can either set to the standard player's handbook rules of 8 hours for a long rest and 1 hour for a short rest, or you can do the gritty realism or the epic heroism from the Dungeon Master's Guide, which either makes it take a lot longer to take your short and long rests or a lot shorter. Uh, all I think this does is when you activate this, it outputs a little message to the chat room that, here, I can show you real quick. So if we click on short rest, rest, it says short rest one hour, long rest, new day, right? If I set that instead for seven days and save it, short rest, eight hours, long rest, seven days, and et cetera, et cetera, right? I think that's the only difference that change makes. As far as I can tell, it doesn't do anything else other than that little output to your chat room, so keep that in mind. Next is the diagonal movement rule, which is set up by default to what is in the player's handbook, which is the 555. Uh, you can also do it alternating to 5, 10, 5, or uh, Euclidean, which is basically every diagonal is 7 feet. Uh, I'll show you what this looks like by starting up a new map real quick. Okay, so first let's start with the 555 rule. Uh, we'll go with our little ruler tool here to demonstrate this. You can see if we go horizontal or vertical, it goes 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, as you would expect. With this rule, diagonals are treated like one square. So 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, just, just as you would expect otherwise, right? If we swap that to the 5, 10, 5 rule, basically it's going to alternate between 5 and 10 on your diagonals. So 5, 10, 15, 20 on the horizontal and in the vertical, right? But if you go diagonal, it starts 5, 15, 
20, 30, 35, 45. So you could see per square, it's it's every other square it's doubling. Um, the third way is Euclidean, which is every 7.07 feet. This does act the, that point oh seven does actually get added eventually, but for the most part, if especially if your tokens are only moving, you know, thirty to sixty feet on average, you'll almost never notice this. But uh, basically, what this one does is same thing, horizontal and vertical, right? 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, right? But you go diagonal, it kind of splits the difference. 7, 14, 21, 28, 35, etc., right? Uh, now, one interesting thing to note is this really only works on the grid. If we configure it to hexagons, it doesn't matter what we do. 5, 10, 15, 5, 10, 15, 5, 10, 15. It's the same thing no matter no matter what we set it to. Uh, and we can even go to the 5, 10, 5, and you'll see it's the same thing. 5, 10, 15, 5, 10, 15, 5, 10, 15. It's the same thing, right? If we take the grid off, it pretty much does Euclidean, uh, where you can see it's basically measuring it out per pixel. It does kind of the same thing going diagonal as it does as it does any other way. So you get the most precise measurement going this way, I feel. Uh, but if you're using a grid, note that that's the only... If you're using a square grid, that's the only time those settings seem to apply. So keep that in mind. Next is the Dexterity Tiebreaker. Uh, I like this being activated. Basically, when you roll initiative... If two characters roll the same, it's going to do a tiebreaker between whoever has the highest dexterity. I believe if you have this turned off, it just does it kind of at random, or maybe it's based on like character name or something. I couldn't I couldn't really figure out a, a method to its madness. So uh, this seems like a fair way to do deal with the tiebreaker. I like it. So there you go. Uh, apply currency weight. This does exactly what you probably think it does. If you turn it on, it adds weight to your currency. And it's I think it's 50 coins equals one pound. If you want your currency to be completely weightless, just turn that off. All right, so next let's look at disable experience tracking. This one's pretty straightforward. If you open up your random character here, you can see we have an experience uh, bar here that we can, if we bump that up to like 150, the bar increases. Uh, if we disable experience tracking, then both of those things go away. We don't get the we don't get the experience tracking bar and we also can't add in experience. This is good if you're doing milestone leveling, for example. Next, let's take a look at collapse item cards in chat. This is a cool one. So if we open up our character sheet, we've got our long sword there. By default, when you activate the longsword, it will, or any other item or spell or class feature or anything that you have in your character sheet, when you activate it, it outputs the text onto the page, which isn't that big of a deal when it's relatively short, although it still adds up space. Uh, but if you have like a really, really long one, like for instance, um, I know martial arts add that and we click that holy cow it takes up a lot, it takes up so much space you can't even see it below my camera right so just imagine somebody you know a couple of people trying to roll dice and then you and then you start kicking those things into gear and all that stuff gets populated out it's a lot right so what you can do and if this is really handy for any time you have you know you're using like a long sword or something and you and you need to roll dice with it you can automatically collapse that stuff. So now when we open up the character sheet and we click on barbarian, can't even see it. Let me move my let me move my camera over, right? Can't even see it. It's just down there now, right? So click on martial arts, starts off collapsed. If you need it, you just click on the name 
and it opens it back up for you, right? Open it up, open it up. It's great for when you're using your weapon. If there's some little special feature that you that's relevant to you, you can click on it, you can find out what that is. But otherwise, you can just roll your attacks and, and whatnot. You know what I mean? Last, we have allow polymorphing, which if you have that checked, then your players get to polymorph their own actors. If you have it disabled, then it is up to the DM to do it. So that's gonna do it for us today. In part two of this video, I'm going to cover the core foundry features. Those are things that are system agnostic and also have nothing to do with like modules or how to connect to the, the server or anything like that. So I hope to see you guys on that one. If this video helped you out, do leave it a like. It really helps me out. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel to get more like this for me in the future. Not only am I doing Foundry Tech videos, but I plan on doing other guides for other software, whether it's map making or token creation or anything like that, other virtual tabletops, and more general DMing and player storyteller advice, stuff like that. I've been DMing for 20 years. I've got a lot of knowledge up here. Uh, so if you guys want to see that, do subscribe. Also, I do stream on Twitch every Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Come drop by. Give me a follow there. Uh, and then um, every Monday and Wednesday at 7 p.m. Eastern, I host my big multi-group, multi-DM shared world campaign, The Chords of Chaos. You can get the links to the website, to the Discord server if you want to join, or if you just want to join a cool community of D&D players. Uh, you can get all my descriptions down below. Hope to see you basically everywhere I am. Uh, until next time, guys, we'll see you then.